worship. We're so glad you're with us. We're going to go ahead, grab your Bible. If you've got something with your Bible on it or, you know, Bible, lift it up, repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I will do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. And my heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. And I will never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> I did. Well, I've had to cancel a couple Thursdays because of snow. and it, It's an attack of the enemy is what it is. It only... It's... And we're glad you're here. I honestly do think it was an attack of the enemy for a little bit. It only snowed on Thursday. <laughs> didn't snow on Wednesdays. Didn't snow on Fridays or Saturdays or Sundays. It only snowed on Wednesday. Yeah. All right. First place we are going to go. Oh, the title for this evening, if you're taking notes, and I always hope that you are, is that all will be changed. Which reminds me, I heard, there was a story one time, that was, there was a nerd, a uh, nursery that a pastor was working at, and he said, you know, we had a scripture that was put up above the door to the nursery, and it was 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Not all will be asleep, but ever all will be changed. <laughs> I always thought that was pretty good. We are going to go ahead and start in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says... Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is, grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as a Savior, he is a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition, have passed away. Behold, new things have come, because spiritual awakening brings a new life. That is, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17. Oh, the thing on the bottom is obscuring, apparently. Anywho, not our wonderful tech people, I issue no complaints for all the wonderful work they do. All of us need to be renewed. Before we accepted Jesus, we had an emptiness inside of us. We were two-thirds of a whole. We have a flesh body, this meat suit that we walk around in. I know there are other ways to talk about it, but that's what it is. It's a meat suit controlled by a tiny battery located about here. <laughs> that's all it is. It's the same electricity a potato clock puts out. We have a soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, the part of us that makes us, us. And then there was an empty space. After we accept Jesus as our Savior, that emptiness is filled by the Holy Spirit, which is the seed of God. And in an instant, we are forever changed. The Bible says that we are taken out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of His dear Son. More so than that, Ezekiel says our heart is changed too. If we go to Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. He writes, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You will keep my ordinances and do them. Our old heart, the one out of stone, is replaced with one out of flesh. And part of what Ezekiel is talking about there is the change from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. The Old Covenant was written on stone. It was a ministration of death. Ten Commandments were written on stone by the finger of God. We know that. Exodus says that multiple times. Deuteronomy says that. But when that Old Covenant was completed, when Jesus died, there was a new heart. 
and to heart of flesh. That also speaks to our worldly ways, our hard-heartedness before we meet Jesus. We're full of cynicism and skepticism, hatred and whatever other nasty traits you can think of that get pulled out and replaced with a new heart, full of tender mercies and compassion and empathy. And according to the Bible, once that heart change takes place, we can understand the things of God now because we have this new heart and we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Before, it all seemed silly. And that's the seed of change taking root. When we accept Jesus, we need an overhaul. We strip off the finish. If it's a car, you strip off the finish, take out the parts, start fresh, because the crap that had got put into it is old and busted and not, not good. You need, in car terms, you need a frame-off restoration where you go down to the fact where it is only the shell. It is only the husk. You are going to build it back up. Another way to think about it, if that doesn't click, is if you've got a closet that is jam-packed, full of crap. I could use nicer words, but that's what it is. Jam-packed full of crap, where you're worried that if you play the Jenga game of taking something out about there in the height of the closet, that it's all going to come toppling out. You don't want to touch it because it's just going to avalanche. But you need to go through that closet. You've got stuff in there, you're fairly certain there might be a colony of mice down somewhere that you have to get rid of. It's not a good situation. <laughs> There's probably dry rot from something that got wet 15 years ago. It's not good. But to clean that out and do everything you need to do, you make a mess. But the only, it's the best way I know how to organize. Spread stuff out everywhere. Get it all out. Empty this. And then I can filter. I can go through. I can put it back. I can put back what needs to be put back the way it needs to be put back so that I don't have to worry about playing a game of 3D Tetris every time I need a pen from over there. <laughs> Jesus is doing that work inside of us. He does it gently. He does it one piece at a time. And he does it as we let him do it. But that work still needs to be done. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Verses 9 through 11. Paul writes, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? A quick note. If you are a believer, unrighteous is what you used to be. It ain't you. I'm going to emphasize that again when we get to verse 11. Once you are saved, God never calls you unrighteous. Not ever. Because that is not what you are. That is not who you are. So that should be the first tipping point that this is not directed at believers. All right. You do, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor effeminate by perversion, nor those who participate in homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers whose words are used as weapons to abuse and insult, humiliate, intimidate, or slander, nor swindlers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. And that is where a lot of people stop. But the chapter doesn't stop there. The letter didn't stop there. And verse 11 is so good it makes you want to do a happy dance. And such were some of you before you believed. But you were washed by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. You were sanctified, set apart for God and made holy. You were justified, declared free of guilt and in the Holy Spirit or I'm sorry, declared free of guilt in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit of our God, the source of the believer's new life and changed behavior. Amen. The problem with those three verses that, is that people leave out verse 11. Because it's easy to manipulate people when you leave out crucial pieces of information. You misinform them intentionally. You can drive people into fear and into doubt so easily. And some do, and they shouldn't. 
God, God will handle them on that. I pray mercy for those people. But by not teaching the whole word of God, you have that clump of people who are driven into humanly, fleshly fear and worry because that's what this flesh wants to do. It doesn't want to do anything that's holy. This flesh wants to do what it wants to do because it wants to do it, when it wants to do it, how it wants to do it. I can't trust this flesh. But verse 11 says that such were some of you. were. Now, you are not. God already sees you as changed. Even if you carry on in a sinful habit, one of those things that Paul listed, God doesn't identify you as that anymore. If you drank like a fish for 30 years, I don't know why everyone says 30 years, if you drank like a fish from the time you were seven and half a day ago you accepted Jesus, as far as God is concerned, you don't drink anymore. You don't. Your identity is covered in the blood of Jesus and in the perfection that Jesus is. Your fleshly body has that habit. You may not be able, you may not be delivered from drinking right then. Some people are. That is a testimony in itself. But some people aren't. And they know that they should stop. They want to stop. But their body is so conditioned and it's become such an ingrained habit for them that they don't know how to not. So even that person who got saved half a day ago if they go home and get just rip-roaring, blackout drunk again, God doesn't see them as a drunk. He sees them as his perfect child. He sees us as his perfect child. Because we have been made righteous. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The devil, the accuser of the brethren, the father of lies, the great deceiver, some of his many titles, will try to trick you into thinking that you need an extra dose of salvation, which just couldn't be further from the truth. You are perfect. I want you to say it with me. I am perfect. Look at someone around you. Say, I'm perfect. And tr I'm perfect. And try not to laugh at them. Because a lot of people will. But by saying that, you're identifying yourself how God identifies you. I know. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God is the one who put us into a right relationship with him. If we look at verse 11, we are washed by Christ. We are sanctified by the work Jesus did on the cross, which means we're set apart and we're made holy. We're justified by Jesus and in the Holy Spirit, which is the source of our new life and our changed behavior. God eliminated the problem of sin once and for all, for all time, for all people. Some people choose to accept the, accept the gift of salvation in Jesus. And some people don't. And they lie to themselves and they say that being a good person is good enough and I'm sorry, but it isn't. The good news is that if you have accepted Christ, no matter what you think of yourself as, no matter what others think of you as, no matter what you might have been told, if you've accepted Jesus, God sees you as perfect and I'm not going to go against what God says. I'm not going to tell you you're not perfect. I'll let someone else do it. If we align our thinking with God's thinking, we could see miracles beyond our wildest imaginations as often as we see the sunrise. 
Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. Paul writes, he says, that regarding your previous way of life, which you put off your old self, completely disregard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires, and be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude, and put on the new self, the regenerated and renewed nature created in God's image, Godlike in the righteousness and holiness of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. We have to choose to walk in the newness of life that God has provided us. God is breaking every chain for us. It's up to us to walk out of them or to drag them around. Second Peter 1 3, I'm not going to read it, but it tells us that God has given us everything that pertains unto life and godliness. Amen. And we know that once we accept Jesus, God only sees us as righteous. I'm probably going to say that a few more times because it bears repeating. God only sees us as righteous forever. It's not going to change. And God is working on us from moment one, even if we can't see it, even if we don't see the fruit of it yet if we don't see the fruit of it as quickly as we would like to, God is still working on us. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not become discouraged, spiritless, disappointed, or afraid, though our outer self is progressively wasting away. Yet your, our inner self is being progressively renewed day by day. For our momentary, Light distress, this passing trouble, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, a fullness beyond all measure, surpassing all comparisons, a transcendent splendor, and an eter and endless blessedness. So we, so we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are visible are temporal, just brief and fleeting. But the things which are invisible are everlasting and imperishable. Amen. Our fleshly bodies are doomed to die. Mm -hmm. Because of the sin curse, God put a cap on human life at about 120 years, back in the time of Noah. It's Genesis 6. It's the first time God says that. Mm -hmm. And most of us don't make it to 120. Our outer selves waste away. We ache, moan, groan, snap. Crackle, pop, Rice Krispies. <laughs> we make all kinds of weird noises, and that's just getting out of bed. <laughs> but that's only our outside. Mm -hmm. Our outside takes maintenance. Our inside takes maintenance too, but it's being renewed and made better and better day by day. Our soul is. Our spirit's already perfect. I can't improve on the spirit. It's God. I'm not going to try and improve God. It will fail. I will fail horribly. It will crash and burn. It will not go well. But I can renew my mind. I can renew my will and my emotions to be in line with God day by day and make them more like the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me. Amen. We keep our eyes glued to the supernatural, not the natural. Mm -hmm. And there is where we can see the work that God is doing on us. In Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4, I'm honestly probably not going to be too much longer. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will make you hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house and saw that he was working at the wheel. But the vessel he was making from clay was spoiled by the potter's hand, so he made it over remaking it, reworking it, and making it into another thing, pot that seemed good to him. When we've come to Jesus, no matter how moral or good we think we are, we ain't. Because that's self-righteousness. And the Bible says that our, our righteousness, our self-righteousness is as filthy rags unto the Lord. You can donate every cent you have, and it's not enough to buy your way into heaven. You can give everything you have to the poor. It's not enough to get you into heaven. Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. He said, I am the way and the 
truth, and the life, and none come to the Father but by me. In John 10, he said, I am the gate. I am the way my sheep get in and out. God knows the calling that he has for us. He tells us if we ask him, though we cannot make ourselves what he wants us to be, only he can do that. And that scares people. To be reworked and be remade. To be something completely new. At first it's exciting. And you think, this is awesome. Heaven, Jesus, church, it's going to be great. And then you realize that it means the devil is going to attack you for the rest of your natural born life because that's his job. Mm -hmm. And you go, I could have done without that. And then you realize that God has a calling for your life, and it's great, but it is not something at all you have a talent or an affinity for. There are people who are called to be missionaries. God bless them, because I am not. I'm not. I'm called to be here. I love being here. But the thought that people have of surrendering the control of what you think you ought to be for what God knows you ought to be frightens people. We've already talked about how God changes us from the inside out. The Bible says that he has given us a new name. He calls us daughter and son instead of wicked and unrighteous. People stop God from doing what he wants with them. He gives us that power, by the way, in case you didn't know. Because identity is something we assign. Our identity, so often, gets tied up in something that is false or something that needs to be healed, and people refuse to give it to God and let him do that healing Addicts, I, have, I think AA and NA are wonderful programs. I think they do fantastic work. But I've got a quibble with them that every time someone gets up, or at least I've never been to a meeting, but every time I've seen people on shows or heard about it, they get up and they say, hi, I'm insert name, and I am an alcoholic, or I am an addict, and I am a this, and I am a that. In Jesus, no, you're not. So why are you identifying yourself as that? Drunkards just say, well, I'm a drunk. Or someone who is addicted to pornography. Or someone who's addicted to work. I'm a workaholic. They're proud of it. I understand you've got to work to make money. But I work so I can live. I don't live so I can work. There are people who are hooked on being an adrenaline junkie. Again, more power to them. I see no reason to jump out of a perfectly working plane. I can't make it click. I'm all for going fast on a road, provided there it is a straight line and there is nothing ahead of me but the tarmac. But, you know, things like hanging on to a kite a few thousand feet above the air, I, 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 I can't get for it. My mom's back there going, yeah, yeah, woo, woo. I am not that way. She doesn't like that I did that. <laughs> or what's worse is the people who go base jumping. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump off a cliff. I don't have the couple extra thousand feet cushion of a plane or a kite. I've got, I'm going to go base jumping. I'm going to jump off this perfectly stable cliff, look like a flying sugar monkey, go down and then hit a parachute, hopefully soon enough. You know when I would hit the parachute? About five seconds after I left the ground, which probably isn't enough time to get up enough speed to make the parachute work. There's a reason I don't do these things. <laughs> or some people are addicted to themselves. And boy, that's a hard one to get over. Other ones that people find an identity in are their traumas. I'm going to press a few buttons. I'm going to make a few people mad. I'm sorry. I don't mean to, but it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. Where people will focus on their abandonment. They will focus on the struggle of 
being a single parent, or they will focus on just being a parent. They will focus on their victimhood or the abuse that they suffered of any kind. And I want to be compassionate, but that's not what you should identify yourself as. Mm -hmm. That's not how you introduce yourself to people. And to cast a broader net, anything that's outside of Jesus, be it work, who you are at work, who you are at home, who you are when, if you're at school, who you are when you're in church, whatever hobbies you have, whatever your relationship status might be, if those are the things that you are binding up your identity in, you need to change it. Mm -hmm. Someday, I'm going to be the pastor here. Pastor Bob has said it out loud in public multiple times, so I'm not too ashamed to say it. I don't like being the center of attention, but I'm told it's coming. And even when I am working as the pastor at Heart of God Fellowship, being a pastor is not the only thing that I will be. Being a pastor is not how I identify myself. Because Pastor Bob has talked about it before, the church leadership could get up together, ban me out of town, mute me, and kick me out to somewhere. And if my entire identity is cast up in what I am inside these walls, and I lose that, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I drift. And, I'm, and I feel lost. You see, God loves us enough to let us stop the work he wants to do in and on and through us because he will never force us. But our identity and our change should come in I am a child of Christ. I am a son or a daughter of God. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They can't erase it. It can't be taken away. They can't go in with white out. I don't care what ink they use. I don't think there's white out in heaven because they don't make mistakes. But, you know, no one's going to white out my name from the Lamb's Book of Life. No one's going to revoke my visa when I hit the pearly gate. I don't know if there even is a pearly gate. I know there is in the new Jerusalem. But I don't know if I'm going to have to deal with it. I don't know. I don't care. I'm just glad they're going to let me in and have a house next door to my wife. That part's non-negotiable, I don't think. God never forces us to do the work that he wants us to do. Whether it's the work he has for us in the physical world, whether it's the work he wants to do inside of us, he never forces us. And if you stop God because you don't think there's enough time for him to do all that he needs to do, you think you might have gotten into the game too late in your life. No, no. Nay, nay, I say, nay, nay. Ephesians 3.20 tells me that God is able to do infinitely and abundantly beyond all that I could ever ask or think. That kind of covers it. Can God, and there's another verse, it's Jeremiah 33.3, is there anything too hard for God? No. And that's actually not what Jeremiah 33.3 says. I got my locations mixed up. I don't know which one that is. Trust me, it's in there. You can remember Philippians 1.6 which says, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, the time of his return. And what's more, God works on the timeline of eternity. He doesn't work in our timeline, which sometimes is frustrating because I want things when I want them. <laughs> But God works on the timeline of eternity. He knows how long he's got as he set it up. God does more than we can think of and he never stops working on us until we go to heaven or Jesus comes back to get us. You are God's favorite kid. It does, I don't care what you did before you came to Christ. I don't mean that flippantly. I don't mean that cold-heartedly. Cold but I don't care because whatever you did, whoever you were before, that ain't who you are now. 
You're delivered. You're brought out of all of that. And you are perfect and you are God's favorite kid. God's going to take all the time he needs to make you exactly what he needs you to be. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says it. I heard a paraphrase of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That's where that statement originates. It says in the dodgeball, my favorite paraphrase of that is that in the dodgeball game of life, God chooses the gangly, limpy, klutzy kids. He doesn't choose the bow hunt jocks. He chooses the skinny kids. He chooses the slow kids. He chooses the klutzy kids. And he uses them for his purpose. I play music well. And I get to use that for God. But if God has called someone who has never picked up an instrument in their life to be on worship team, then God's the one doing that. And he will qualify them because that is what he has called them to. Think about all the people God used in the Bible from a natural perspective. Among other things that we would consider failings, Moses didn't start leading the Israelites till he was almost 80. He tried to get a head start, but it went wrong when he killed a guy and ran away because wouldn't you? <laughs> Gideon was a coward. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Solomon couldn't think with the right head most of the time, I don't think. Paul was the Pharisee among Pharisees. I know I'm going to get letter calls about that Solomon comment. It's funny. Paul was the Pharisee among Pharisees. Peter denied Jesus three times the night he was betrayed. Philip was a waiter. And we know absolutely nothing about Stephen until he is selected to be a replacement apostle in Acts chapter 6. He has no history. We know nothing about Stephen. God doesn't care who you were before you came to Christ. So why do you? I don't mean that mean. With all the love and compassion I have, why do you? Why do you get hung up on the things you've been healed from, the things you've been brought out of? Yes, that is who you were and you made mistakes. But God made this new day, this new today, for us to enter into his rest and to receive his mercies and to walk out in his grace. Like I said earlier, change scares people. And God knows that. So we have promises that never change. God does all things in balance. And what's more, those promises are answered yes and amen through Jesus Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 1.20. If it's not first, it's second. Promises about who he is, about help and guidance that he gives us, about his faithfulness, about our salvation, about wisdom, peace, love, joy, riches in heaven, adoption into his family, renewal, and everything else that we will come up against in our lives. I'm going to read a quick selection of them and then we're going to close. Psalm 48, 14 says, For this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Isaiah 30, 21, your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or to the left. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it is because of the Lord's loving kindness that we are not consumed. Because his tender compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great and beyond measure is your faithfulness. In Revelation 1, 5, and from Christ Jesus, the faithful and trustworthy witness, faithful and true, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who always loves us and who has once and for all freed us or washed us from our sins by his own blood and his sacrificial death. And Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is eternally changeless, always the same, yesterday and today and forever. Whatever, I don't know 
where you are in your walk. I only know where I am in mine. Unless the Holy Spirit gives me a word of knowledge in the moment, I don't know what's going on with you. I know what you'll tell me. But I know that we are all still being worked on and being changed from how we have identified ourselves for years, if not decades, is scary because it takes away who we thought we were and makes us something that we may not understand yet. And we'd like to know so we can feel in control. But if we surrender God to control, it's hard to hold on to it ourselves. No matter how scary it seem, let God change you. Yes, you will come out def- different than you went in. You will also come out infinitely better than you came in. Trust God to know what's best. He always does. Let him do the work that he wants to do. He will never fail you. He will never shortchange you. He may not do the work when you think he should be doing the work. He may not change a situation when you think he should change the situation. But luckily for us, he has perfect knowledge. He has all knowledge, perfect wisdom. And he knows exactly when everything needs to be done. This has honestly been a sermon where I'm talking to me and I'm just happy I'm not alone in the room. But I pray that as we go from here, that we would take this and we would have a soft enough heart that we would use our heart of flesh to submit to the change that God wants for us and that we would be obedient in whatever it is. It can be as simple as not listening to music all the time so that it's easier for you to hear what God says to you. It could be reading less so that you spend more time with God. It could be working less so you spend more time in balance with your family and with God. I don't know. But I know that God is always working for our good. Father, I thank you for who you are and the way that you love us. I thank you, God, for that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Lord, I pray, I'm very confident about the people who are here tonight, but I pray if there is anyone watching or listening who has not accepted Jesus, that they would do what Romans 10, 9 says. They would believe in their heart that you raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and they would confess with your, their mouths that Jesus is the Lord. Because the Bible says that if they do those two things, they will be saved. Father, I thank you that as we go from here, we would look more like Jesus in all that we say and do and act and think. God, that we would be a bright neon sign pointing straight to you, that you would give us the boldness to submit to change and to tell people about Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you send workers for the harvest because the days are few, the harvesters are many, and the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God, I thank you for the work you are doing inside of us. I thank you that you never give up on us. You never stop working on us. You are always good. I give you all the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. And Lord, I speak a blessing on everyone here in the six major areas of life, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Father, pour out your love, your power, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way. Now, when the rest of the world sees them, they will say, surely these people have been with Jesus. If you all receive that, say amen. amen. That is a beautiful thing to hear. I love you all terribly. I'm so glad you came tonight. There is nothing you can do to stop me from loving you. Have a fantastic week. God bless you.